Aloha and welcome to Tough Love with Loretta Chen, where Hawaii's changemakers talk tough on the islands they love. Our guest for today has dedicated her life to preserving traditional culture and is passionate about childhood development. She's a globetrotter, having worked in over 20 countries in diverse fields such as public communications, management consulting, and marketing. And since 2001, she has been studying with Buddhist masters from the Himalayas and Bhutan and began leading field trips to preserve folk music as well as develop a music edition, uh, education curriculum for children. She's also been working to preserve traditional handicrafts and created her own sustainable fashion line. And in 2012, our guest founded the Academy of Himalayan Art and Child Development, an NGO dedicated to preserving Himalayan wisdom and art to share with the world. Please welcome Quin Quin Tuan. Hello, Kuzuzongpo. Kuzuzongpo. Thank you so much. Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I first met you, Quin Quin. I mean, one of the arts, right? A Singaporean girl meeting a Chinese lady here in Hawaii, and we both bonded on Bhutan. I think, let's get started Bhutan, uh, on Bhutan. I think many people are like, huh? Where is Bhutan? Why don't you tell our audience, we've never heard of uh, the Himalayan region in Bhutan. Um, tell us a little bit more about Bhutan. Okay. To those of you who haven't been to Bhutan, <laughs> Bhutan is called the happiness country in the world. It's located in the corner of Himalayan region between India and China and next to Nepal. And it has a population less than two, uh, 80, 100,000 people. And in their constitution says, and 60% of the land has to be covered by forest. Mm -hmm. And one of the hobby for Bhutanese people is to plant trees <laughs> and to accumulate merits of life. And they don't uh, measure their life by GDP, and, but to measure their life uh, with a gross national happiness. So on that note, yes, you know, one of the things that I think a lot of our audiences probably don't even uh, recognize is that uh, while 60% of the Constitution says that uh, well, well, the Constitution says that 80% of their land, 60% uh, of their lands must always be uh, covered by forestry. Actually, 84% is being covered by forestry. And so yes, far. every time I go there, the students are planting trees, they're going on excursions. But let me just quiz you and, and, and um, get our audience up to speed on, explain to us, what is gross national happiness? What is GNH? So, um, GNH is a philosophy and way of living mm -hmm. uh, developed by the brilliant, uh, enlightened fourth king of Bhutan. Yeah. And His Majesty actually developed this philosophy when he was only 17 years mm -hmm. old. Mm -hmm. While he's seeing the world That's right. is developing That's right. with a fast speed of consumption and the Mother Earth is bearing more and more things from the human being. Yeah. And he's thinking really far future for the human gener for the human and the Bhutan young generations. So he developed this new system mm -hmm. in which he applies uh, to from any decision the government make, project right. make, and the social uh, entrepreneurs make, all based on the national growth happiness, which is not only for development of economic, but for the well-being of the whole society and the whole environment and the whole community. That's right. And it's uh, predicated on, it's, it's very much human-centered, right? That is, objective yes. cannot be just the relentless pursuit of GDP and money, uh, but really, it is based on the philosophy that the individual, all individuals want to achieve peace and happiness, right? So they actually yes. came up with uh, four different pillars, pillars which is uh, conservation of the environment, yes. um, equitable and sustainable development, yes. good governance, and the yes. preservation of culture. Yes. So, I mean, I'm with you, because you know, I've been a consultant, international consultant to the government of Bhutan. But a lot of Americans or a lot of our audiences alike may just say like, but what is GNH? I mean, this is hogwash, right? How do we ground it in real actionable goals? I mean, you have done it and I want you to tell us uh, what have you done? And so 20 years ago, um, I started to, uh, because of my practice of Buddhism, mm -hmm. I started to looking into preserving the dying out Malayan music and culture uh, handicrafts. Mm -hmm. So I took my team and traveled through villages. Mm -hmm. And while I going through villages, I start to find out the true essence of Himalayan culture mm -hmm. actually is harmony, it's right. peace, and why this whole region is impacting the earth for mm -hmm. thousands of years mm -hmm. and has so many hidden wisdom is because they knew only if one as human being to get deep connection with themselves in harmony, 
and to have harmony with community and family and have harmony with nature. Mm -hmm. And then everyone can live in peace right. and the life can go on sustainably. Right. And so far, all the troubles or so-called crisis we having on Earth, mm -hmm. whether it's climate crisis, mm -hmm. it's economic crisis, mm -hmm. or it's education crisis, and actually, if we look at the root cause, right. it's because our human nature crisis. That's right. I mean, I think we have a slide on you on, on how a lot of the crisis that we have is really a conflict between ego and eco, right? Yeah. I, think, I think right now we if, have a little visual here as well um, that shows um, like ego and eco. But then if we, took, if we take a look back at, at the visual before that and we look at how we've developed in the last um, uh, 20 years, you want to share with us a little bit more about how yeah, because uh, everyone been. think U.S. and China and the East-West culture is a major difference, conflicts, right. well, a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Actually, as a human being, if we look at life mm -hmm. as a long history, right. and looking back in the 1960s, if we can look at the chart again. Yeah, and, the chart again. Um, mm -hmm. So this, this chart has been well used in the economic research mm -hmm. and uh, on, on human development economic uh, research. Right. And by 1960, mm -hmm. collectively, Collectively, all human beings on Earth, from human development, beginning of this civilization to 1960, mm -hmm. we only used up half resources of our Mother Earth. Right. From 1960 to 1980, mm -hmm. we break even. That means all human beings on Earth just used one uh, enough that Mother Earth has to supply us. Right. But something dramatic happened. Right. From 1980 to 2010, we used up one and a half Mother Earth, That's right. all the resources. Yeah. And at that time, United Nations had the big call to the world yeah. to talk about we really need to take some conscious actions for our future development That's of right. the Earth. So the prediction is if we don't change our way of living, mm -hmm. our way of thinking, mm -hmm. way of acting, by 2050, we will consume three Earths. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to consume three Earths? Yeah, that means yeah. we have eaten up our grandchildren's food. <laughs> yeah, we have drink absolutely. up the fresh water of our grandchildren, yeah. and they will not. They will, they will be left over with all the polluted land and water and trash. Yeah. And if we can take action from 2010 collectively from mm -hmm. all the human beings on Earth, do a sharp turn do reflection and modify our way of consumption by 2050, we might have a hope to bring back one Earth. Mm -hmm. And this is a very challenging job mm -hmm. to do. Yeah. But actually, it's also an easy job in the Bhutanese's view. That's right. Because they have been living in such way, mm -hmm. which the foundation of life is contentment. That's right. And our perspective of life actually decide our way of living. Mm -hmm. So that's why in the GDP system is ego-based. That's right self-centric mm -hmm. individualism. And in a GNH, is echo-based. That's right. It's talking about collective consciousness, mm -hmm. well-being with all the beings seen and unseen mm -hmm. with our eyes. Yeah. That's why in Bhutan, they're targeting to build our, their forest with forest bridge across the country. Why? Mm -hmm. They don't want their animals cross road. Mm -hmm. They want their animals always have a forest grass path to mm -hmm. go. Which country does that for their animals? Yeah, so again, like I said, I, I, I'm with you because obviously I, I consult for Bhutan and I'm in Bhutan a, a lot. It's, it, it is my second home. But for people who are in industrialized uh, countries, you know, in, in, in big cities, right? And they will say, yeah, right, like how am I going to build a little footpath, you know, to allow the animals to coexist harmoniously with me? Uh, how do we even begin to apply this uh, practically in today's terms? And then you have uh, a little solution for that. And that's why you're starting from trying to change the mindsets of children from when they were young. So you started this uh, nonprofit, and you also started this concept of happy school. Yes. Right? Tell us a bit more about happy schools and, and what do you intend to do uh, to get us all happy and what does that education look like? Yeah, basically, um, happy school is developed based on national uh, gross national happiness, which mm -hmm. is developed uh, um, also after United Nations in 2016 did a uh, a vast research on Asia Pacific mm -hmm. schools uh, and education system. Mm -hmm. Sadly enough, in that report that we found out, the more score uh, the STEM, so-called STEM right. scores are higher, the more sick 
more the well-being of our children are worse, like suicidal rate and Society depression high, and yeah. PDD children develop rate are higher in the region or particular school, mm -hmm. especially in Korea, Hong Kong, and Singapore, Singapore is yeah. ranked very high. So mm -hmm. United Nations actually put out a call to the earth that our future school on earth should be happy school. Mm -hmm. Our education purpose should be uh, focus on developing the well-being of our children mm -hmm. first, because when we talk about sustainability nowadays, what we what we're sustain? If we don't have a sustained children, yeah. a generation, young generation, how can we have a sustainable future of our Mother Earth? Because if our children are not healthy, happy, and violent, and they can only do violent things, wrong things to our Mother Earth, mm -hmm. and we're dumping 180 million tons of trash in our ocean. Mm -hmm. I mean, coming to Hawaii, I learned aloha. Mm -hmm. When you understand aloha, you understand the GH. Mm -hmm. It's the same concept. Mm -hmm. You have to live in harmony mm -hmm. with all lives and yeah. to, to respect Mother Earth. Yeah. And so the happy school concept was developed from Bhutan, applied in Vietnam, Europe now, even with exercise. We even tried in China, mainly because the report from UNESCO found out the biggest cost for education failure of well-being of our children is three disconnection. The number one disconnection is self-disconnection. Our children don't know who they are mm -hmm. when they grow up because they filled up with things, not learning how to be. And being is not having, mm -hmm. but our current consumption uh, environment is still, is only telling our children having more, mm -hmm. being more competitive mm -hmm. is the way to success of life. Mm -hmm. But that's not a fact. Mm -hmm. Other parts of the world don't live like this. Mm -hmm. And the second disconnection is disconnecting with families and communities. Mm -hmm. And so that caused social problem, mm -hmm. depression of our children. Mm -hmm. And then third depression, a uh, disconnection is disconnecting with Mother Earth. Right. Because from a childhood, they are disconnected. They were not taught properly how to respect Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. You can't expect a child never being an ocean, being a forest, to love ocean forest when they are 30 or 20. Mm -hmm. They will not have this uh, action of mm -hmm. love. And because our children's development has a rhythm, mm -hmm. under 14 years is the time you build their value system. Mm -hmm. You build their harmony mm -hmm. within, sustainable system within. Mm -hmm. So the goal of Happy School is to build, help children to cultivate right. a harmonized life being sense. That's right. Start at a young age. That's right. Then extend it to family supporting. Mm -hmm. So the parents have to be part of it. If no happy parents, no happy children. That's right. Uh, on that yeah. note, we're going to go for a little happy break as well. And then we, when we come back for, from the break, we're going to quiz uh, Kun Kun more on how exactly we're going to implement this. Because a lot of people may just say, oh, this is just taught by crazy rich Asians, right? Like, how do we actually implement it? So uh, stay tuned. We'll come back after your happy break. See you later. Thanks to our Think Tech underwriters and grantors, the Atherton Family Foundation, Carol Mun Lee and the Friends of Think Tech the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, Collateral Analytics, the Cook Foundation, Duane Carisu, the Hawaii Community Foundation, the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, Hawaiian Electric Company, Integrated Security Technologies, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Kamehameha Schools, MW Group, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sydney Stern Memorial Trust, Volo Foundation, Yuriko J. Sugimura. Thanks so much to you all. And we're back on the Tough Love with Loretta Chan, where I quiz some of Hawaii's change makers on the things they're doing to make Mother Earth better or, or worse. Uh, so today we're talking to Quinn Quinn Duan, uh, who's a dear friend of mine, but she's also the founder of two NGOs, one that looks into education and the other to look into a childhood development. So before the break, we were just having a conversation on how we create happy schools. Um, and lots of people obviously understand that um, school stress is now on the rise. Um, there is a correlation between a high depression and suicide rates in, in, in 
societies and countries that score really well in, in STEM. Uh, and I can speak for ourselves because uh, my husband's Korean and I'm from Singapore. We're both from, you know, these very like high stress uh, societies. I mean, we do well in school, but, you know, that's why we're here now in Hawaii. We're like, oh, OK, we need to uh, kick it back a notch. But, but jokes aside, um, how do we really begin to implement this notion of happiness and happy schools in, say, an American system? Uh, because a lot of people will say, yeah, sure, we all want to be happy, but is this just something that crazy rich Asians do? You know, we, we take our children to, you know, happy, expensive schools. I mean, how do we make this affordable, viable? How do you propose we do that? Actually, happy school is a concept that not only apply for school, mm -hmm. and we not only now are uh, testing or exercising. Uh, this is not newly born. We have right. been exercised for the last 10 years mm. in Bhutan, now in Asia, uh, in Vietnam. Yeah. 45 public schools mm -hmm. are adopting happy school system. Right. And in Switzerland, in Geneva, the city of Geneva is thinking to make Geneva the first happiness city wow. in Europe. Yeah. So actually outside America, a lot of happy actions are going. Yes. But basically, when you talk about transforming society, mm -hmm. I think we have to come back to the fundamental question mm -hmm. that is our perspective of life, mm -hmm. individual life. Mm -hmm. So we need to start from self-healing mm -hmm. to social transformation, mm -hmm. which, which I'm promoting from happy mom education, mm -hmm. from individuals, from mm -hmm. the family. And at mm -hmm. the same time, we're also offering training for school teachers because who spend most of the time with our children? Right. The teachers and parents. Right. So we have to work two legs, and one side emphasis on happy family, mm -hmm. and one side on happy teachers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have a series of practice workshops mm -hmm. and travels, and people have to see it first. This right. is not newly invented. Actually, there's a country on earth called Bhutan are living, practicing daily mm -hmm. with around 80,000 people, 800,000 people. Right. So, I see solutions coming up from West education system. It's like a bandage. Yes. And so you need to look for the cost, mm -hmm. root cost, mm -hmm. which we need to start to respect in life mm -hmm. from a per different perspective. Mm -hmm. And we need to respect the rhythm of our child development, right. which we don't. We just pushing our kids com competitive, more competitive. But actually, this earth as a boundary. If everyone is compete for more resources, in three generations, we're finished. Mm -hmm. So how can we, living in Hawaii, bring me this conscious awareness mm -hmm. that we are actually living on an island called Earth, mm -hmm. and aloha ha means breath of life. Mm -hmm. We don't share a common ground, we share common breath. Right. And if we think about that, just bring the simple awareness of aloha to everyone, mm -hmm. we actually can connect each other mm -hmm. at a higher conscious level mm -hmm. and start living more respectful to mm -hmm. each other, to our children, to mm -hmm. our society. And mm -hmm. people will accept more mm -hmm. the concept of changing daily life in a more self-content way mm -hmm. and uh, environmental way. So let me just ask you, ask you this again. It's tough love, so I want to just play devil's advocate, right? Do you not see a danger in us becoming so content? I mean, one of the things I love about living in Hawaii and Bhutan is that I do feel happier. I do. I do. I feel happy. I feel more content. Is there a danger, though, that we can go and become a little bit too content where uh, it, it conflicts with you know, the desire to work harder, to be more productive? I mean, I've been really tempted since I've moved here to Hawaii to just go spend my time at the beaches, you know, or when, when I'm in Himalayas, to just go spend my time hiking up mountains. How do we begin to balance the need for productivity um, and the sense of contentment? In a healing, I mean, balance is always the key, right? How do you propose yes. to even be begin to, to do that or unravel that? That is like the age old dichotomy, east west, right? And how do we even begin to unravel that? Yes, this is a very important question, which leads to the fundamental question again the cause, the different perspective yes. of mm -hmm. life. You see, productivity has different meaning in different culture content mm -hmm. in culture. In Bhutan, this is called productivity, this piece of uh, a coat I mm -hmm. designed is used a two year long hand waving fabric. Yes. So in Bhutan, people would spend two years to meditate over a piece of beautiful fabric mm -hmm. and wave it, uh, synchronize their appreciation to culture and to their spirituality mm -hmm. and to the five elements of nature and all the beautiful uh, patterns of nature. Mm -hmm. And they manifest through their artistic finger into the fabric. And, and then what? And they will wear this fabric and design into clothes for their children, for the beloved families, 
and full of respect to gurus, teachers, right. and they also sell a good price in the market to right. the customers who appreciate it, like me. Yes. And everywhere I go in the world, I wear Bhutan fabric because it's it's a piece of art. Yes. So when you consider the overall well-being of a life as the first priority, productivity is to support the well-being. It's not your well-being, sacrificing your well-being to su support your productivity, which in the GDP system, we're sacrificing our nature resources, our human resources. Listen to the Eng English. Language is a skin of our culture. Our English language, we call everything resources. Because why? We want to use up resources. Resources is to serve the single ego purpose of human greed. So there's no respect in this language. And which in Hawaiian language is a totally diff different direction in the Eastern Chinese language and in Bhutan the yeah. same. So this come back to how do we define life goals? Mm -hmm. If our life goal is to work together mm -hmm. to make our country, our society, our young generation to move together in harmony with Mother Nature, then that's any productivity is designed based on balance and yeah. harmony. But if our goal is only to pay attention to our investors or shareholders mm -hmm. or our uh, creative, uh, create, uh, increase of our productivity of things, then that's another diff difference. That's and right. our sac we are sacrificing everything. So I think we need to first to bring awareness of uh, life that what is the certain definitions of things we're so used to and which has been put in our brain since That's a young right. age. And again, like I said, you know, this is tough love with Loretta Chan. So I have to ask you, you know, uh, tough questions, right? Uh, I mean, I, I'm with you because when I was in Bhutan, like this piece of fabric that, that I'm wearing is from Bhutan. Uh, and, and I remember when I was in Bhutan, um, they, they don't have a lot of money. So what they'll do is, you know, in exchange for, you know, because I, I go there and I teach and I train them. So they give me a piece of fabric that they've woven for yes. an entire year. And I'm yes. like, right, this is their entire year's uh, life. Um, time. The point I'm trying to make is, People will say, yeah, but that's great, Quinn Quinn. That's because, you know, maybe you, 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 you are well-established and you're able to pay $10,000 for this coat. The average working class, middle class professional or, or student will be like, I want to su support sustainable fashion, but it's too darn expensive. And time is money. I need to go out there and, 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 and you know, work to pay rent. How can the average person begin to incorporate sustainable practices in their life when they are strapped for cash. Because we got to admit, eating sustainable um, organic food and dressing up in sustainable fashion is expensive. How can the average person do that? I think this would take some time because we have been in this GDP system which is controlling the earth for the last um, 100 years, but the, uh, speed it up last 30 years really uh, did some damage on, mm -hmm. on the earth. But I think um, if we start to educating people, mm -hmm. show people, share people, what is the fundamental relationship? Let's see from life, from fashion. If you understand your skin is your second biggest breathing organ okay. beside your nose, that if you understand 25% fertilizer chemical used for, organic, uh, for growth of a cotton, and almost mo majority of the fabric on the market has toxic to your skin, you would think you want to live longer with healthier yeah. life. Especially with and, how uh, expensive health care is. Yeah, yes, and you yeah. would want to search into um, um, organic fabrics and for your children's health and mm -hmm. growth. Mm -hmm. And actually, there's, there's many hope in the young generation. I know many young uh, mm -hmm. designers and uh, uh, young people are searching to learn Absolutely. organic dye and it's mm -hmm. cotton. I mean, this is silk. Silk mm -hmm. is the most expensive thing mm -hmm. now in in the organic uh, fashion, mm -hmm. but we can build the learning about organic wearing yes. fashion uh, from a young age to yeah. young mother's education. Yeah. And also, we need to teach young people, you don't need to own so many clothes. Mm -hmm. and, and you need to own high quality. That's right. You want a high quality that is benefit to your health, your spiritual, the holistic life. Yeah. Way. And so one last, I mean, a fabric in Bhutan like this pass on generations. Mm -hmm. I have collecting antique fabrics mm -hmm. from Bhutan, mm -hmm. which been wearing for four generations. Yeah, exactly. And they are still beautiful. You mm -hmm. still can wear them. Yeah. And so it's really a matter of how you look at life, how cherish, how much you cherish yourself. That's right. And this come back to the self-connection mm -hmm. again, to the happy school. 
we haven't taught children putting healthy food in their mouths, mm -hmm. putting healthy mm -hmm. clothes on their body is important for their well-being, for the society well-being, then they would never do it. So if we start from a young generation mm -hmm. now, I would see in 10 years, we'll see a difference on Earth. I mean, in fact, we're, we're already seeing difference. I mean, we see how youths are now striking, you know, not, not you know, uh, striking for climate change. 16-year-old climate change activist Greta Thunberg, who is like, you know, person of the year, she gained recognition when she went on strike from school, right, last year to protest climate change. And now it's sparked a whole series of worldwide demonstrations, most recently the September 20th strike that drew an uh, estimate of above 4 million people, right? She, she's led by example. Um, she's traveling around to events around Europe by train. Uh, in fact, in August, she traveled on a zero emission sailboat to, to the U.S. So just very quickly, we now have just like uh, under three minutes. I mean, what she's doing now is creating all this awareness on, on climate change, right? Um, in fact, the reports of Swedish airports that have now reported a decline in travelers because a lot of activists now have attributed this to the Greta effect because a lot of people are so aware of humanity's impacts on the planet that, that they now are trying to cut back on their travel. How do we begin to suture the, these um, thoughts, right? On the one hand, we want people to travel to become more aware of what's happening out there and looking for sustainable practices, but then now we're also seeing uh, perhaps like a backlash. People don't want to travel because they're like, oh, no, now I'm c contributing to um, greenhouse gases and, and carbon emissions. What do you say to that in 90 seconds? Okay, <laughs> so travel is a, a huge industry. It's one actually is uh, ranked number two, I think, impacting the Mother Earth. It does bring environmental issues, but uh, as a learning journey for a use, mm. travel is important. I think yeah. it's not a matter not to travel. It's a matter how we travel. When we travel mindful, selectively, yeah. uh, with a high awareness, and then it works. The program we launched called Operation Earth Travel and in Asia between uh, Bhutan, China, and Hawaii, we are promoting when the young travelers go, and we will offset their um, travel emission by planting a tree in the local region where they go in, yeah. and bring their, we develop this organic tea a product uh, uh, skincare uh, set for them to travel with, uh, and we developed the uh, travel gears for them. They, it's reusable. Right. So during the travel, try to learn from the culture where like Hawaii can teach them how to reconnect with nature mm -hmm. because it's, Mother Earth is so beautiful here. You don't want contaminated Mother Earth here in the ocean, in the forest. Right. Young people get it very fast, actually. So make travel as a moving education. Mm -hmm. A moving happy school is my goal right. and my team's goal. Yeah. And of course, we need to reduce unnecessary travel because we're living in such an internet world. Mm. But certain travel to help local community and to gain their confidence. Actually, if more visitors come to Hawaii with respect, right. learning, learning with the intention, Hawaii with the intention learning about aloha that's right i think we help the community in hawaii to appreciate their own culture that's right and and with that thank you so much uh, thank you for watching tough love with loretta chan uh, because tough times don't last but tough loving people do thank you so much Kun Kun. thank you thank so much you, for being loretta. aloha thank you so much thank you